This episode of Darkology is brought to you in part by In Search of Darkness, an upcoming retrospective on the 80s horror era. If you're like me and love that retro synth horror aesthetic, stay tuned till the end of the video. A game I'm a big fan of is Dead by Daylight. It's a survival horror game that mixes elements of freeze tag with hide and seek, where you either play on a team of survivors trying to escape a purgatorial arena, or the killer who's trying to sacrifice them. And since it's released in 2016, Behavior Interactive has added a variety of different killers to the game, dipping their toes into as many horror tropes as they can, from original characters based on various fears from clowns and cults, to woodland hags and vengeful spirits, to even large brutes with machetes and chainsaws. And what's more, they've even included some licensed killers from cult film franchises. It's a game that embodies a certain subgenre in horror. The Slasher. Yet out of all the killers who you can be pitted against, the one that I have the most fun with, and the only one that legitimately creeps me out when I see it, is the shape. And it's not like the way in which he kills you is all that more severe than the others. It's something about the way he stares in the distance, patiently, quietly. It's got an unnerving quality, unlike the rest. Every horror fan has their favorites, and Michael Myers is one of mine. For me, he's one of the most interesting presences on screen, an enigma because he's not really a character. I find myself the most curious on what he's about, far more than most other slashers and horror movie icons. Indeed, he's one of the more mysterious and intriguing ones out of the bunch. But why? Is it simply because he's selectively mute? Is it the fact that his particular brand and flavor of horror is based around the human psyche, which we still know next to nothing about in the greater scheme of things? Is it his simple, subtle, and subdued design? Or is it just that killer horror synthedelic club track? I kept asking myself why it was that Michael evoked a sense of dread and interest unlike the kind that I get from killers like Freddy or Jason. What is it about him that gives him that unique flavor of creepy? So today on Darkology, we're going to explore our psychological reaction to Michael Myers, and just what it is about him and his behavior that is so creepy. Michael Myers and Halloween are widely considered to be one of the first of their kind, inspired in part by the suspenseful work of Alfred Hitchcock, Mad Men characters like Norman Bates from Psycho, and the intimate horror of the Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Halloween and the villain Michael Myers would go on to further inspire this newfound trope in horror, igniting an era of horror movie slashers that would take on similar behaviors to The Masked Man in films that would follow a familiar template, the killer that didn't just kill you if you happened to visit their residence, but would follow you and invade your private space, hunting you like it was a game. Indeed, if Psycho was an inspiration to the start of this new subgenre in horror, Halloween can be seen as the true beginning to the golden era of the slasher film, giving way to the success of other cult classics like Friday the 13th, A Nightmare on Elm Street, Hellraiser, She doesn't even go here! Child's Play, and Scream. And speaking of prolific slasher icons, we'll be exploring a bit of their characterizations as well, to gain a better understanding of what gives the shape that undying intrigue in Halloween. But the nature of sequels, spin-offs, reboots, and retcons in Hollywood is notoriously messy. <laughs> and perhaps most notably so in the horror film industry. The Halloween franchise in particular has one of the most complicated and divided canons with multiple timelines that have diverging characterizations of the shape. So which version of Michael Myers do we analyze? For this episode, we'll only be focusing on the events and lore of the current canon, the original Halloween and its 2018 sequel. That means we're throwing explicitly supernatural blood relation and repressed psychosexual stuff out the window. Remember, the examples in this video aren't meant to prove which killer is the best, they only serve to contrast and articulate what it is about Michael's behavior that works so effectively in the creepy category. What exactly defines something as creepy? 
It's something we've partially explored in other episodes of Darkology. We've seen it in dolls, in old and young people, in otherworldly hauntings, in clowns, puppets, and insects. So it's clear that there are different types of triggers that can send a chill up our spine and make us feel creeped out. Yet scientific research specifically examining creepiness is surprisingly limited. Until recently, the closest studies we had focused on strange nonverbal behaviors and our expectations for what normal human behavior is, something I touched on in Why Are Old People Creepy? Back then, I hearkened to how we have a tendency to pick up on certain nonverbal mimicking cues during a social interaction. How when we perceive signals that are inappropriate, there's cause for concern. Like when you're in a situation with a stranger and they make no eye contact, or the flip side of that, where they never look away. Back then, I also hearkened to a 2016 study done at Knox College in Illinois. It was the first empirical study specifically aimed at just what gives us that sensation, the creepy variable. The researchers hypothesized that feeling creeped out comes from an evolved adaptive emotional response to the ambiguity about the presence of a threat, and that it enables us to maintain vigilance during times of uncertainty. In other words, it's the anxiety that comes from the uncertainty of whether there is something to fear or not. On top of unusual social cues, that study also found that other specific traits like sex and hobbies had a stronger influence in whether a person was perceived as creepy or not. For instance, males were generally found to be more likely to be perceived as creepy than females by both sexes, and creepy hobbies involved collecting things that were unusual especially things that humans are naturally predisposed to fear, like insects and snakes. And it also included things that could only be acquired after something has died. And depending on your outlook, these are things that might give you the chills in the wrong environment. In 2012, a collaborative study between the universities of Groningen, Duke, and Yale found that there was a positive correlation between suspicious nonverbal cues and physically feeling colder. In other words, they found that people literally feel colder in response to inappropriate amounts of nonverbal mimicry. It literally gives us the chills. And it's something that obviously depends on the given situation. So when figuring out what makes the shape creepy, another crucial element we need is context. Sometimes villains who serve as the antagonistic force in a story are given some kind of characterization that makes them appeal to audiences. It's not uncommon for horror franchise icons to eventually have a backstory revealed that explains how they got to where they are. They get to have motivations or nurturing influences explaining what they're about and what drives them to do the things that they do. And some even get quirks or personality that we as audiences learn to expect, which in its own sort of way gives us a comfort in the most bizarre of places. For example, Freddy Krueger is a vengeful spirit looking to cause suffering not only because he was burned alive by the parents of the children he was abusing, but also because he simply relishes the cruel nature of his actions. With Freddy, he's sadistic and overtly insidious, to the point that there's really no questioning as to the reasoning behind his motives. He achieves pleasure by causing pain, something offset by the fact that he's also a talking head with so much personality it's no wonder he hosted his own anthology series for several years. Don't worry, here at Corpus Rigor Mortis, we're always looking for new members. <laughs> Jason Voorhees is a hulking supernatural undead brute. He was born with severe facial deformity, hydrocephalus, and mental disabilities, and as a child was bullied and drowned for it. He seems to kill not only because he hears his vengeful mother's voice in his head telling him to, but for revenge on the camp counselors that enabled his death. Leatherface, on the other hand, kills out of fear, not malice. Given his implied simple nature, you get the sense that if it weren't for the influence of his inbred cannibalistic family, he'd be rather innocent. Where are the kids? Where are they showing? 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 Where are they His behaviors and very existence seem to be driven by a ritualistic desire to spread the gospel of pain and pleasure, this ethereal hedonism, like a twisted inversion of Jesus. We have such sights to show you. But what do they all have in common? We understand their motives. Whether it's something like vengeance, fear, or devotion, they're all things that we can sympathize with at least to some degree. 
Even if some of them don't speak, we have a rudimentary understanding of what kind of person they are or the people around them that influence them so. And as villains, they all induce fear because they're a threat. End up trapped in the same room with any of these and you're probably not leaving that room in one piece. It's the second they open their mouth or we start to sympathize with their character that the creepy aspect starts to fade. Yes, they're scary, but it'd be a stretch to call any of them creepy. I mean, Freddy is pretty damn creepy. But not in the sense that I'm referring to here with the shape. If I were to add Michael to that list, really all I could say is that he murdered his older sister when he was six for no reason, doesn't talk, and just seems to have a preference for standing behind things, stabbing people, and staring at walls? Feeling creeped out is a warning. It's different from a clear threat to physical or social harm. We feel creeped out when danger is unclear, uncertain, ambiguous. Michael is creepy. Like, actually creepy. Earlier, I mentioned that there were certain hobbies in the Knox study that were considered higher on the list of creepy traits. A big one that popped up was hobbies that involved watching. Michael Myers spends much of his time in the film simply watching. There's a foreboding aura of suspense whenever he's doing it, whether far away or up close with the sound of his breathing. In fact, the first few scenes where Laurie glances at Myers simply watching from the distance are particularly spine-chilling because there's a sense of neutral mystique there. It's not with an over-the-top dangerous energy where there's a hulking monster swinging around a chainsaw, or a burnt man with a sinister smile waving with a clawed hand. It's subtle. What does this person want? There's something about that unending uncertainty that is more draining. And before you can ponder too much on it, you look again and it's not there anymore. Did I imagine that? What if I didn't? It's a psychological torment. You're not exactly thrown into fight or flight. You're near perpetually left in the state that precedes it. Suspense. Michael Myers is seemingly characterized by a motivation to return to his hometown of Haddonfield and kill. But why? This is where it gets interesting because yes, he doesn't speak, but unlike the other killers who don't, the story here doesn't give us an alternate route to look into his psyche. The context of what we're told about Michael prior to killing his older sister doesn't really add up to his behavior. There was no established external influence for why he did what he did. Not even a psychiatrist, Dr. Sam Loomis, can get a read on him. Michael just sat in his asylum cell for years afterwards, staring at the wall. Inhumanly patient. This isn't a man. In another episode of Darkology, we explored what makes children in horror so creepy. And one of the defining characteristics of that trope was the idea of a child who was simply born evil. No influence of nurture, but rather a psychopath void of reasoning for their murderous nature. We can understand the traumatic genesis for what turned a child like Jason Voorhees into the murderous rampaging behemoth he becomes. It's a pretty understandable justification for seeking revenge. But if there was a defining trauma that could have turned a normal child into the mute stalker we see in Michael Myers, it isn't shown in the film or explicitly mentioned by John Carpenter. I met him 15 years ago. I, I was told there was nothing left, no reason no uh, conscience, no understanding, and even the most rudimentary sense of life or death, of, of good or evil, of right or wrong. I met this six-year-old child with this blank, pale, emotionless face and the blackest eyes, the devil's eyes. I spent eight years trying to reach him and then another seven trying to keep him locked up because I realized that what was living behind that boy's eyes was purely and simply evil. John Carpenter is notoriously vague about the details involving the psyche of Michael Myers. When asked about the inspiration for the evil force of nature and the sort of characterization described by Myers' psychiatrist, Carpenter harkened back to a class trip he had to a mental institution while in college. There, Carpenter met what he described as the most seriously mentally ill patients, one of which was a young boy that gave a schizophrenic stare. It was unsettling to me. And it was like the creepiest thing I'd ever seen just because as a stranger, it was completely insane. The point is, Michael Myers maintains an air of ambiguity in his behavior, 
a loose air of emptiness that lingers around him, despite having an official name and backstory. He doesn't talk, but more so, and unlike Jason or Leatherface, he doesn't have any clear motivation for why he does what he does. And unlike them, Michael isn't established as being mentally disabled or having a low IQ. There is a Hannibal-esque calmness and calculatedness to his patience and stalking behavior. I mean, don't get me wrong, he's no genius either. But despite that, he does possess intelligence, is aware, and chooses not to speak. The horror community is long debated and theorized about the character, but the clues seem to be left intentionally vague. The reason why Michael appears creepier to us as an audience is because of the narrative tools not utilized in Halloween. John Carpenter intentionally leaves out key points in making a character sympathetic or relatable, something that often goes on to reduce the frightening aspect of a killer in other horror franchises. We do get a backstory, but how much does that backstory really do to tell us about Michael Myers the person? If anything, his backstory only serves to further eliminate and reduce any potential humanizing factors that might have existed. We can't relate to Michael, not in the least. His backstory is almost like a scapegoat, a false expectation to find some kind of humanity where there is none. When faced with Michael, the seemingly important details of his past are as good as irrelevant. There is no bargaining or communicating with him. And what makes it all the scarier is the sense of awareness. He's aware enough to know what he's doing, and he does it anyway, without any seeming influence or regard from others. In Halloween, Carpenter and his team understood the concept of fearing the unknown, and executed it. The less we as an audience understand of something, the creepier it feels to us. Halloween is very much a slasher flick, but it also has potent elements of a psychological thriller as well. In real life, one of the biggest misconceptions of psychopathy is that anyone who lacks empathy is just going to go out and hurt people. It's easy to assume that those born with a predisposition for psychopathic traits are delusional, all the same, or can't be changed. And like much of reality, it's far more complicated than that. The shape subverts that understanding. And that's what is so great about this enigma. What makes him so intriguing is our own psychological curiosity for things that don't make sense. It has little to do with the character himself and more to do with us as an audience. While watching Halloween, we naturally project our headspace onto that of Lori. But after, we're left pondering the villain. As humans, we thirst to learn more about that which we don't understand, which is why Michael is particularly fascinating. Mystique is woven into the very premise of his character. We can apply all of our scientific and pseudoscientific knowledge to achieve a likely cognitive context for his character if it were based in real life, but he wasn't written to be understood. There's no emotion there. Anger, sadness, joy, nothing. And I think that's why the 2018 film picks up from where the original left off. Because that's supposed to be the case with Michael. It was what was so effectively chilling about him in the original. It's part of his design. These random acts of violence, that's exactly what they are. Random. There's no reason for it. It's a bit like if while writing for a character, you asked yourself, what if darkness was a person? There's not really a word for what he is, but the closest one we have is used to describe him constantly. Michael Myers is not able to be understood. There is no humanity. What you see is what you get. To us, it's just evil. Plain and simple. But you know what isn't evil? In Search of Darkness, an upcoming documentary on the 80s horror film, the highest form of good. For the first time in horror history, In Search of Darkness is bringing together 80s icons, modern horror greats, and popular horror influencers to create the most complete retrospective documentary of the genre ever made. It's a project that I'm personally very excited about, and if you like my content and the aesthetic of my channel, I think you'll really like too. They've got interviews with iconic horror legends like Heather Lankenkamp and Nick Castle. Oh, and they also recently got John Carpenter in on it. It features music from New Retrowave, the up-and-coming collective of all nostalgic synthwave music, and are currently in their final campaign to make it even better. It's going to be the definitive 80s horror documentary experience. You don't want to miss this. Not only do you get a copy, but there are different tiers of rewards for various levels of contribution, like a limited edition t-shirt, tickets to the premiere, and an exclusive A2 poster featuring this delicious horror mashup by Graham Humphreys. You may be familiar with some of his work. Oh, and did I mention at the base level, your name gets plastered in the credits of the film. 
That's right, you can be crediting it forever as helping make it happen. They have an amazingly transparent website that goes into far more detail on what you get. So if you're like me and like that retro horror aesthetic and want to help support this project and be immortalized in it forever, follow my affiliate link down in the description below. 20% of all proceeds for In Search of Darkness from Darkology fans go back to this channel, which helps me continue to make more content like this. So it's kind of a win-win. The campaign ends on March 31st, 2019, so if I did my due video making diligence, that gives you 8 days to be a part of this before those rewards are gone forever. Michael Myers may never expire, but this offer does, so don't sleep on it. And as always, thanks for watching.